Hello everyone. Welcome to our next Context Coffee Chat. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Welcome, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Katja. I've invited Felipe as well. Okay. Your um, business partner from Faf Coffee, is that right? Yeah, all right. Correct. Okay. Oh, hello. Welcome. <laughs> There you are. Hi. Hi How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great, I'm great. So glad It's nice to be here. I hope my farm internet is okay. Oh yeah, so far so good. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I want to welcome you, uh, both of you, to this episode of the Context Coffee Chat. Um, we'll be talking about um, specialty coffee in Brazil and um, also growing specialty coffee in Brazil and doing it sustainably as well. And I'm really excited to have you two to talk to about this topic today. Um, you're, you're both uh, the, the founders of uh, Fast Coffee, is that right? Brazilian specialty coffee exporter. And um, we'll talk about a special project that you're running uh, right now under the path flag uh, called Lado a Lado, side by side as well. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. Thank you so much for making the time and for being here. <laughs> It's a pleasure. Um, maybe we can start. Thanks, thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm really glad you could make it. Um, maybe we can start by um, talking because I'm not sure um, how much people actually know about Brazilian coffee and, and about Brazil as a coffee growing country as well. So maybe that would be a good talking point to start with. Maybe, um, I mean, Brazil is the biggest coffee growing country in the world. It grows, um, most, most of the harvest is commercial coffee, commercial grade coffee that is traded on the commodity market. Um, and then there is a smaller section of the Brazilian coffee market, uh, but an increasingly important segment that's specialty coffee as well. And um, so maybe we can just start by um, you telling us a little bit about your beautiful country and how coffee is grown and some facts. Perfect. Rafa, quer falar primeiro? Ah, acho que você pode falar, eu falo do projeto do lado a lado, e você segue com <laughs> é, Ok, so, um, Brazil is, uh, it's a big country, um, and we are responsible for around 45% of the production of coffee in the world, um, and we have uh, a range of, of uh, more than 1,500 kilometers uh, in our coffee production regions um, so there's a quite a lot of uh, diversity in uh, soils and microclimates and harvesting times um, so there's this uh, it's extremely rich uh, in diversity and culture country um, so um, there's a lot of misconception maybe uh, about what is Brazilian coffee and what a Brazilian farmer looks like um, so, you know, we have uh, everything from the super professional, more mechanized uh, farms um, in, in more flat areas. And we also have uh, mountainous, beautiful, high mountain regions with uh, family farms. Um, and so FAF uh, ourselves, uh, we are uh, farmers, uh, we're a family, family business, and uh, we work with uh, smallholder family farms um, so we are in four parts of the country. Uh, I'm in Sao Paulo, um, in the Mogiana region, south of Minas, and Rafa is in Espírito Santo, uh, which is just north. And so uh, I run uh, the Mogiana and Sujiminas most, mostly regions, and Rafa runs the Espírito Santo and Caparal regions in the north. So it's, uh, yeah. it's a collective of about... Uh, more or less 400 farms that we are um, directly working daily, um, but we, we uh, uh, attend and, and cop with, uh, with a lot more than that. And yeah, we stay, we stay, we stay, we stay, we stay. Put that into... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Say that again? 
<laughs> we say 1,000 kilometers uh, the distance than, than here. Yeah. And that's huge, isn't it? I mean, just to put that into a bit of a context, I think there are um, around, well, at least 70 uh, coffee growing countries in the world. And Brazil is one of them, one of 70. But the entire production on a global scale makes about 45% of the global coffee market. I mean, that's huge. Um, that's something that, you know, maybe you can let that sink in for a second. And then um, I think what's important to me as a specialty roaster, and I think that that's the real difference that you make in your work, is the fact that you work with small or coffee farmers only, essentially. Um, but as far as I know, um, the, the large majority of how coffee is grown in Brazil is on, on big coffee estates. As you said, they have you know, square kilometers of, of uh, coffee trees in rows uh, that are being harvested by big machines. And that's the sort of image that most people you know, with, with a basic knowledge of, of coffee uh, probably um, that popped into their mind when they think about uh, growing coffee in, in or how coffee is grown in Brazil, right? And so um, I'm I'm really really curious to to hear a bit more about uh, the work that you do and uh, what kind of coffee it is that you're after. In my mind, you're a type of um, Indiana Jones, you know, coffee scout who <laughs> roam the forests of uh, of Brazil for the best beans uh, to be had. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, I um, we we definitely have um, a very diverse country. So uh, a, a small holder, just to put in context, a small holder farm in Brazil uh, is uh, around anywhere from five hectares to about thirty hectares. Okay, uh, that's that's um, uh, a family farm. Um, and um, may produce anywhere from 70 bags to about, uh, you know, uh, 500, 600 bags. So that's kind of a small uh, holder farm in Brazil. And, um, you know, uh, that most of Brazil is actually, more than 50% is actually family farms in the country. But of course, we have this uh, perception abroad and, and in most places that Brazilian coffee is kind of, um, more industrial and more monoculture and more kind of flat tasting, right? You have these sort of low, sort of uh, low acidity and, and, and toffee and, and nuts. But um, what we're after, and, you know, it's, I guess in a very simplified way is we try to produce and we try to help our. Oh. I think it is <laughs> the connection. Yeah. Uh, Just Philippe, at the most exciting point yeah. in his sentence. <laughs> Philippe stay on the farm and the uh, is a hot place. <laughs> I, am I back? Yeah, you're back. Yeah, we lost you at exactly at what we're after is, and then you were gonna describe the types of coffee that. Again. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. That, that's country life, isn't it? Life yeah. on a coffee farm. <laughs> you're back. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Maybe you can pick it up from there, Rafa. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so, it's, it's okay now? Yeah. Hi. It's okay. Go ahead, Rafa. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you just finished your, your words. Maybe you can continue. So, uh, yeah, I think me and Hafa and our team, we, we kind of, our idea is we want to produce coffee that we like to drink, right? That we think is, is delicious. And it sounds simple, but uh, that's kind of what we try. And, and it's maybe less romantic than, 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 uh, than it sounds. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, we're not really coffee hunters. Um, we, we're, we're not tasting until we find Actually, we working, we're working with our producers uh, for many years. Yeah, uh, I just 
to come Terrace. back. But um, sometimes um, uh, we go to the farms and we stay all day uh, working really side by side with, with the farms. And we make a different uh, process and uh, we begin together the farms and when that lot uh, stay ready, uh, the same lot we we make a natural process, we make it fully washed, we make it honey and the fermentation. And when dry, we back it uh, with the, the our lab and the cupping uh, to get the farm. Okay, now we have a good receipt uh, for your continuous. Uh, it's not like, oh, it's, this is region is new, uh, have nice trees. Okay, I put the sample and uh, not, not like that. <laughs> a bit more intense, yeah. So uh, that's where we get to lado a lado, no? Uh, side yeah. by side. So you actually go, go um, you don't hunt for coffee, but you go and find coffee farmers who yeah. are interested in... Um, in and maybe learning <clears throat> more about what coffee can taste like. And also, I guess I, I always wonder, um, I mean, Brazil is a bit different maybe because there is a coffee drinking culture in Brazil as well, right? Where in many other coffee growing countries, people um, who live in the country don't drink that much coffee because it's a valuable export um, good that they can make money with. But that yeah. means they also don't really know what their coffee actually tastes like. And I think that's a bit different in Brazil. Yeah, yeah. I think this, this, uh, this time we uh, have a little chance. Um, people from Brazil uh, begin uh, drinking better coffee. Uh, but um, then uh, 10 years ago, I think uh, the most people don't know nothing about quality coffee from Brazil. And yeah, we have a... We have different flavors uh, from Brazil. My region is specific uh, when I... Oops. Right, so we were talking about um, your work with Lado a Lado, basically saying Brazil is the biggest coffee producing country in the world. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there are big, big farms, but there are also um, a big number of um, small farms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And while uh, the majority of the coffee produced in Brazil is commercial coffee, mm -hmm. um, the coffees that you are searching for, or let's say the farmers that you uh, want to work with are uh, specialty coffee farmers who are interested in um, experimenting with different processing methods, um, but not just for the sake of experimenting and because that's something that's trendy right now in the coffee world, but first and form foremost, I would imagine, to improve their quality, right? And to keep mm -hmm. working on, on right. getting better and in order to also get better prices. But I'll let, let you take the word and uh, tell us a bit more about what you do in your project, Lado a Lado. Yeah, yeah. So um, when I was uh, begin on coffee. Uh, my father uh, was a uh, producer of coffee, but when uh, I begin in the technical area, um, well, was uh, 20, 20 years ago, um, Espirito Santo was the worst coffee uh, from Brazil. Uh, the farmers uh, didn't have the uh, information, didn't have, okay, had good cherries, had uh, good trees, but uh, don't have the education about it, what I do now. So we have a, a particular difficult because uh, we stay very close to the ocean. Uh, we have an instability cl climate. So uh, we have uh, a lot of rains uh, during the harvest. And uh, this is a problem because we have uh, a strong fermentation around this area. So mm -hmm. uh, that time, uh, when I was beginning, the most time from this area was natural process, but didn't have a good, uh, good process. Uh, and it was coffee, the, that coffee was all phenolic coffees. And um, introducing new uh, technicals like, okay, now uh, let's try uh, the pulp, the coffee. Okay, mm -hmm. when the pulp, the coffee, okay, now not more uh, phenolic, but 
uh, now what the next step uh, uh, leave the, the cherries um, the good cherries here and separate the green and okay now we have the coffee 80 82 points uh, Okay, Philippe, uh, in again, maybe you can invite him. Your, uh, I've sent him invitations, but maybe his internet is too in unstable, huh? Yeah, yeah, let's okay. try. We'll okay, see. yeah. <laughs> um, oh, so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on the tree. <laughs> uh, I uh, so came to the, the get some, uh, some cell service. So one of the perks oh, of living on one of the perks of living on the farm is great internet. <laughs> <laughs> you have to wave around with your phone. <laughs> yeah. And in, right. uh, this time it, uh, the farm is didn't have an uh, option for sell your coffee. Uh, sell only to uh, local local um, commercial and normally is commodity. Uh, and did have hostility about this coffee. Uh, did have information about this coffee and lose and lost your coffees and 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 um, no, no traceability is what no you're yes no no traceability yeah and so um, twenty years after we had a different scenario around the region and. It, our mission uh, is connect this farm um, to nice roasters and keep this working and uh, create a long term uh, and yeah and uh, with projects we can stay more close uh, from the the producers so uh, maybe Philippe can help me now I continue this. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's a uh, long-term work for sure. It's uh, I think as as I was saying the last time is uh, is less about finding coffees than than together as a group and uh, creating the type of flavor that we want, getting the results that we want, finding you know together with you guys the coffees that you want to roast and the feedback so that as a group we redesign the supply chain so that we're all actively you know, working continuously on what's in the cup um, as a beverage. It sounds simple that coffee is a beverage, but for many of us producers, it's there's not that exact connection with good roasting and good brewing. Um, so it's um, it's about bringing that and bringing uh, the insertion into the the, the value chain. So uh, just a little things from having you guys. Uh, putting the name of Theodore Stein and Fabia and sending them the the picture of the, the coffee. And yeah, and so uh, it's like a trophy case in his house now. You know, he, pr he printed a big, uh, big, uh, what do you call it, thing on the wall. And um, it's just more, it's a, of course, there's the financial recognition, but there's just the more, uh, being part of something and and the recognition and so he's becoming a model farmer in our area in, in the Spiritu Santo area um, it's uh, three years since he hasn't used any kind of, of agrotoxic chemicals and in the soil and you can see the soil is becoming alive there's more biomass he planted a lot of fruit trees he has peaches and tangerine um, and, and it's just a kind of, you can feel the farm is alive. Um, so it's, uh, it's great to sort of, when you have farmers that are naturally, um, they're naturally more conservative to investing and, and trying new ideas. So you have, uh, a, someone like Teodoro and Fabia that are really open to trying new processing methods, new drying methods. And so just knowing that there's someone roasting and working hard with this coffee, um, they, they're that much more excited and less, less worried, less anxious that, you know, they can invest and they can improve. So there from that map that Hafa is showing you right in the middle of the yellow, the yellow area there, the, the beige area is the high quality coffee production regions of Spirito Santo. 
and right in the middle of it is, is our office. So we have several communities there that have unique terroirs. And so we adapt, we help the farmers adapt with the types of trees uh, to, the, to, to make sure that they produce better. Uh, so, you know, behind me is mahogany, which is a good tree with coffee. So we've identified 10 types of trees that work well with the coffee and in different regions. So you have in Spirit de Santo this unique um, humidity that comes from the coast. So you see that then the map that it's very close to the coast, that it makes it more like a, um, colder, colder nights and colder days. And this brings more humidity, brings more acidity to the, to the flavor profile. It almost reminds more of like a Central American terroir or a Colombian terroir and you have part, parts of the region, the state, that maybe have a more um, crisp acidity and parts have a more salivating acidity, but um, it's definitely a unique uh, part of the country, you know? And so there's, there's so much, um, so many different regions to explore uh, that, that you can I, I, uh, tell people that you can dream with Brazil. It doesn't have to be just sort of, you know, one massive farm that produces the same pro flavor profile. You can have a lot more excitement to it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's so much in, in what you just said that um, I, I can just turn around and, you know, un unravel from this end of the value chain because it's, it's, uh, it's the same, essentially, just on the other end. Um, when you said that, uh, there is a disconnect between what the farmers do with their hard work on the farm and then they don't always have a very clear image of what actually happens with their green coffee when it then gets to you know places like this gets thrown into a roaster and then ends up in a cup somewhere in a cafe but it's it's the very same the other way around i think most people who drink coffee especially you know when you just have it in the morning um, in this part of the world, they have no idea how how hard people uh, on the other end of the world are working to make that cup as delicious as it is, right? Uh, there's so much to it, and it's it's so different, right? The work you need to put in at origin to make the coffee taste good is so different from the work that we put in at this end, <laughs> to you know to continue the chain and and to get the the best out of what the farmer has invested in, in growing and and making it good and yeah i think i mean from this end of of uh, the value chain i can definitely say that the the coffee that that i've tasted that my customers have tasted um from from you from espirito santo and from half uh, via right side coffee in uh, barcelona are just absolutely mind blowing. Like if if you know if you did a, a blind cupping and put your coffees next to, as you said, some of the uh, Central Americans or even Colombia in some cases, I think um, especially people who you know who maybe aren't as experienced wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Your coffees definitely don't taste like the stereotypical Brazilian coffee that coffee um coffee people from the industry think about when they think of like a brazilian filling component for a blend or something like that i mean your coffees couldn't be further from that they're just am amazing as you said juicy and and super nice acidity profiles and yeah so um it's definitely something that's happening in your corner of brazil isn't it <laughs> things are changing yeah, I think that um, as an industry, you know, a lot of, I find a lot of people who work with specialty coffee, you know, us on both sides, it's kind of this quality of always never settling, always trying to do a little bit better, always trying to push the boundaries. And you see that in the best baristas, you see that in the best roasters and the best farmers. It's just never, never settling for, okay, this is good enough. You know, and I think we've gotten a point in our industry where we're starting to mature and we're asking questions and where, um, you know, Brazil used to be 95% Catuai and Mundo Novo, two, two varieties that the government told us that that's what you needed to plant. And now it's like, well, why? 
you know, and Spirito Santo, so Catuai in the mountains and Mundo Novo in the, in the flat areas. So Spirito Santo is 99% Catuai. And now you're starting to see all of these new varieties that maybe have a more interesting um, acidity or floral aspects that, that, that really go well with the terroir, you know. Um, and, you know, I would never forget, I once visited the La Marzocco factory in Florence and um, I, I finally went there and I said, every espresso or barista training I've ever heard has always said, okay, well, an espresso is nine bars of pressure and, and, and 30 mLs and 25 seconds. And I said, okay, so I found the original Italians and I said, why is an espresso nine bars? And they said, well, it, when they switched from a lever machine to a button, they, the engineers asked the boss of Amarzoko and he said, well, okay, well, um, the, the lever, it oscillates from eight to 10. So we have a button. So what do we do? And he said, okay, well, nine. Okay, so nine. So that became the rule because one person said so. So it's, you see this in coffee everywhere, right? You see, why do you fertilize with this? And why do you dry like this? And why do you, and now you see this whole generation of farmers that are just, questioning and just trying and just asking questions and now trying to ferment like this and like that. So Hafa and I were, and our team were constantly working with these farmers to come together with them and guide and, you know, and guide and, and kind of be the, also the, the eyes and ears of what the roasters are saying and say, okay, not this way, this way, this way, not that way. And then, so it's really about, um, it's really about taking more, uh, signature, you know, uh, of, of what does that taste like? And so if you say, you know, hopefully 10 years from now, it would be like, you know, it, you know, it tastes like a Brazil or what does a Brazil taste like? You'd be like, well, that's, that's an absurd comment, you know, because that's 2000 co k kilometers distance, you know, there's so much diversity, but I think we're well on that way. Um, you know, and there's a lot to explore, I think, uh, in coffee for all of us in the future. Definitely, definitely. And I guess, um, you know, for, for a big country of 2,000 kilometers, uh, a stretch of growing coffee, um, things also have to change because of climate change. But maybe actually before we get to that, um, I would like to dig a little bit deeper and, and uh, see because uh, the picture that um, – you guys gave me to use uh, to promote this coffee chat it shows you in front of this amazing van. And so I just want, want to see if you can paint a picture for us what your work actually looks like. Like what, what happens when you get into that van? Can I fall off it? No, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the idea from uh, van um, begin because uh, on the harvest, normally uh, the producers wait for end the, the harvest to bring the samples to uh, to office and okay, I cupping and end. Um, we didn't have the chance um, to to say what the problem or what uh, the the way to change and make and improve the quality. So when start the harvest. Uh, we moved the van uh, to the communities and we um, normally uh, the, the next, the, the first step is uh, talk about the harvest and talk about uh, what the plan for the, uh, the next two or three months when you picking the cherries and we starting cupping the first, the first lots. And it's uh, for me, uh, the, the cupping coffee is like a mirror and you can uh, cupping okay uh, and you have this mural it this mural say oh had some problem uh with the um, machine maybe the machine is not so clean maybe have some greens passed direct with the cherries um, and when we copy with the, the farms it's possible uh, to farms understand about this problem uh, because uh normally uh who make it artisanal beers know about your quality beer, uh, who make you wine and know about your quality wine, but farmers don't know about your quality coffee. Uh, normally farmers don't, don't have uh, the chance uh, to cup in your coffee. And 
and this uh, stay close more the farms and we we look uh, the happy when the farms come in your cough is normally uh, your first first time and wow look it look it feel, feel your flavor feel flavor your cough I never tried no, never like this because normally uh, farms produce good quality but uh, leave the the worst coffee for uh, for your drink. Uh, normally, for your own kitchen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And when and how many how many people um, or how many farmers even have the um, the capability of of roasting the green coffee that they produce? The, because the samples that they would bring to your office before you had your van. Those are green coffee samples, aren't they? Yeah, yes, yes. Green, only green green samples um, bring it to to office. And um, yeah, only green. But we this time we receive uh, each year uh, six samples. Uh, only this this office here, and um, we work around the uh, fourteen cities, fourteen, uh, and it have in different communities, but have some. Uh, coffee farms uh, have quality, but don't believe it about your potential. And when we go and work together and pick the cherries together and process together and after you back it, uh, uh, to cupping together, uh, look, you have great coffee here and the work uh, wait for your coffee. And um, the idea is uh, connection of these farms with people like Joaquin, with people like you, uh, this is our working. This is our job. To get get that connection, and essentially, I think the the most important aspect of that work seems to be access. Then, right? Yeah. Where before you started doing it this way, the farmers were doing their thing on their farm, and then sent samples to you in your office, and you. Um, taste them and you tell them, okay, we buy it or we don't buy it. And maybe you give them some feedback, but um, with, with the way it is now, because that amazing van you have is equipped with everything you need, right? Uh, from from uh, whatever you might need uh, to harvest, to then a small roaster to roast uh, the green coffee, uh, all the cupping equipment to then taste the coffees. And I would imagine other measuring devices like uh, the, the moisture levels in the green coffee and all, all of these things, quite expensive equipment that mm -hmm. the individual farmers a lot of the time wouldn't be able to afford on their own. But um, through the work you do side by side, they get access to equipment, to know-how, to knowledge. But through that, they get access to a market, don't they? And that, that's where the dots connect and, and we talk to each other and, you know, I connected with Teodoro. That's just one example, right? But that's, that's direct access and open lines of communication. And I think that's, that's something that's really only been happening over the last 10, 15 years, really started to, to um, happen like that. <laughs> ah, please, yeah. Felipe. I would say also as a as a, um, tasters, as professionals, we've understood much better, you know, because you can taste what's in the cup and you can gather ideas of what happened. But when you're on the farm roasting 30 lots from that farm or those three farms and you're looking at the plots, you start to connect the dots. So our team, we've been able to, we've been able to identify flavors like, uh, certain trees close to certain coffee trees, what those influence on the flavor. We've been able to identify what a eucalyptus tree tastes like close to coffee. We've been able to identify what a tree tastes like. Um, we've been able to identify uh, all kinds of, you know, if the depulping machine is dirty or if it's, or if, if they're pressing it with too much pressure. We've been able to identify and codify within our team those flavors and where they come from to a good degree of confidence now where we can go back and say, I think this is happening. Can you explain to me what happens or can we go see this coffee? And so we can, we can try and correct or give ideas 
uh, very punctual and also with the farmer in front of us because sometimes we don't we forget or it's so much stuff or we don't have time to talk to him so it's just so much quicker and we can print out we have in our systems we prop everything in cropster we have everything from the previous years from feedbacks from roasters be like this particular lot it, it lasted very well or this one aged very quickly and so we go back to the farmer and say listen this roaster he wants to work with you but uh we had this and this issue and so we'll look and we'll say well how are you storing your coffee and and this and so we started we started um providing grain pro bags for our farmers to store especially in speed to Santo, it's quite humid so so the coffee lasts much better if you dry it at once and store it in grain pro um we've been able to increase like two or three months our our shelf life and then we've seen some patios that heat up too much so we've uh, uh had them like teodoro installed a little bit of shade on the patio um, so that the coffee never achieves a temperature that's too high so it wouldn't degrade the cell wall structure. So um, I think for all of us, just really understanding and grasping such a complex uh, thing as coffee and all the little things that could happen, we've been able to, to improve our, as a team and improve the, the response time and also just being able to cup day lots um, we can start to do the whole process of, so we cup an average lot size is like three bags, five bags, seven bags. So as we start to put together a blend, it can be from one farm or from two neighbors or something that we're going to get to 150 bags. Um, we start doing that on the farm. We send samples to you. Um, we just have much faster time of response. Um, farmers always need to get paid quick to pay the harvest, to pay the, 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 the fertilizers of the next year so we can pay them faster, we can ship you faster, we can get you fresher coffee. So, so getting, getting out behind the counter, as Hoffa says, you know, we, we're, not those, we're not those coffee guys who just sit there and wait for the farmer to deliver. We, we're out behind the counter and they, and they feel so much more um, that we're a part of helping when we're on the farm and we say, hey, let's clean your depulper. Like, let me show you it'll work, you know? And our team actually goes there and does it with the farmer. And then the next time is they, they, they're like, okay, we cleaned it. You know, it's, it's, it makes a big difference. I think it's those little things. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the way you describe it, um, it sounds like such an easy process. And essentially that's, that's a process that you'd find in any, um, you know, well-functioning company uh, that's quality control within a business, essentially, but within the coffee value chain, um, to actually connect those processes and have those lines of feedback, those direct lines of feedback, that's, that's a huge thing, isn't it? That's, uh, that's like frontier work almost, because that, that it's not a given. It's not a given. Um, not in Brazil and, and uh, not in most other coffee growing countries either. And I think that's, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing to hear about, about this work and to, to realize, you know, because even I, as a roaster, I cup a lot of coffees and I spend my days tasting coffee and trying to improve my sensory skills and all of that. But there are um, some aspects, like what you just mentioned, what kind of an impact certain plants in the surrounding of the um, coffee farm have on the flavor of the coffee or what a, a taint from a, an unclean uh, a piece of machinery in the post-harvest processing, um, how that impacts the flavor. Those are aspects that I'm just, I'm disconnected from. So that's not something that I would be able to recognize because I just, I would never know, right? <laughs> And I think that's, I mean, that's where your work really is invaluable to, uh, to, the, to the entire chain, essentially. But, but I would imagine especially also to, to the farmers at the very beginning. Um, because they, they don't, as you described, they don't um, frequently have the opportunity to taste their own coffees when they are roasted um, and also roasted in a way... Um, 
that's similar to the way that it would be roasted in the consuming country. I think I, I find it fascinating. <laughs> I mean, yeah, even, I even for me, I would never, like, I would have never even thought about the fact that, that the shade tree on the coffee plantation could actually make such a specific difference to the, to the um, flavor profile in the cup that you can differentiate between different species of shade trees. That's just crazy, <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it seems simple, right? You know, shade and coffee is good, but, but you know, to find the right uh, diversity of, of species and the right diversity of the right spacing as well so that you don't drop the production. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of trial and error. And I think that, you know, um, all of us who we do specialty, we invest in quality and, and you see it over time. You know, you see people uh you know some of my friends who are not in coffee they say why do you invest so much in quality why don't you invest more in branding or in marketing or something so i think quality is the core of what we do and you you see that in roasters who who invest in their storage invest in their roasting and, and i think like us that we work with the same farmers in in difficult times like this year you know where people are roasting like the past year and a half, people are roasting older and older coffees than they've ever roasted, right? Um, and you've had a lot more issues with past crop and stuff like that. I feel like the, 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 the roasters that have been buying from the same farmers and working out those issues, they're, they're really grateful that their coffees are lasting. You know, they're roasting more than a year old coffee and they're like, I hope this is still tasting good and, and it's still tasting good. So I see some really great feedback from roasters, um, you know, and you roasting Teodoro and, you know, it's, it's holding up for 15 months, you know, it's, 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 it's really goes back to working out those little things, that little difference and making sure that your equipment's clean, that the drying was done well, that the storage was done well, and maybe a normal year where well, that coffee will go, you know, be roasted in six months, but, you know, you really see the difference. Uh, over time, those little those little things. So I think that you know we're quality we're quality businesses, and I think that you see that specialty keeps growing. And people, normal consumers, it doesn't seem like it on a day to day, but they are you know paying attention and they're not stupid. So it's it's for sure. I think it's it's the right way to go. Yeah, definitely. I mean, more and more people. I mean, especially I, I can obviously only really talk about uh, my customer base and what's around me, but especially during this past year, people have definitely come to appreciate um, quality in food particularly uh, more, and they are willing to sit down and you know, listen to conversations like this one and um, take, take knowledge away from them and then apply that next time they go to the supermarket or not to the supermarket, but to their small delicatessen shop or wherever and and uh, decide to buy good quality, pay a little bit more and maybe get a little bit less in quantity. But uh, they know that they've invested in a chain that's that's worth the extra investment, definitely. How has your customer base changed in the past year and a half? Have they evolved in any way or how is their reaction well, to to the way it's that you're big, communicating it's for me that's a, a tricky question because th that's basically the time that i've been operating i started <laughs> yeah. the business right before uh, corona <laughs> so um but um i mean the the amount of of retail that i sell is a lot higher than i thought initially it would be i thought there would be more wholesale business but i do actually um sell more coffee um, to end customers, which is really nice because, you know, that's where I get that direct feedback um, um, about about the coffees and how, how they really like them, how they love them. And, you know, especially with Teodoro's uh, coffee, um, that's that's been a bestseller for sure because people just love that nice balance between those, those chocolatey um, and smooth notes uh, that everybody's looking for in coffee, but then at the same time, um, it has this fruity element that's a bit new and exciting 
to um, most people who aren't that experienced with experimenting with different specialty coffees and, and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, for sure. I, I think uh, the last year isn't, isn't really representative of, of anything. <laughs> hmm. um, so we've all just improvised and done our best. But as you said, uh, to know um, that I'm, I'm working with um, partners along my supply chain who care about quality as much as I do and at the same time care about sustainability as well um, has been really reassuring. And I, I could definitely tell by, by the way the coffee roasts that um, there isn't a huge difference from when I first started roasting it. I think maybe May, June, up till now. I just wrote the last batch, I think two weeks ago. And it, it was very consistent and, and uh, I didn't have to make huge adjustments uh, to stay uh, within my roasting parameters. And that's always a good sign. That's always a good sign that the farmer has done a really good job in how uh, they processed the coffee, right? And how they prepared it and made it uh, storable and improved the shelf life as you described. Nice. Um... When when the the package uh, arrived to for to Teodoro, uh, Teodoro cried. <laughs> Teodoro cried really, yeah, because it's um this is very important. It's not not so um about the um quality, not so about the uh, price, but it's about um um put the farms on the on the the front the the super stand. Yeah, normally uh, the farm is stay alone uh, in remote place uh, and not stay connected all the world. And now we have Teodoro here watching us, uh, talking about your coffee and uh, listening to us about your life. And it's very important. And this time uh, it's clear for us, your neighbors um, stay... Um, uh, stay uh, uh, improve your quality and improve your process uh, for for search people like you uh, for improve your life is this is very important for us yeah and and for for me as well to know that you know by choosing to work with you guys with Joaquin uh, through right side with you guys and then uh, <clears throat> Teodoro um, that it actually does make a difference I think that's that's the main reason for me to be in this business and to do what I do. I mean, I, I love that the coffee tastes great, <laughs> but it's at least as important that um, it's done right, right? That, that I know that Teodoro and his family can actually live off their hard work and, um, and feel motivated to, to do more, to continue, to um, have fun with it as well, right? To not just yeah. break their backs uh, yeah. by laboring on their farm but to actually enjoy what they do <laughs> yeah that's what i do and so i i think it's a much better value chain if if that notion wanders through all the way yeah i think you uh <laughs> we work side by side like like that uh we yeah. group supply chain i i think this this is the unique way yeah yeah i agree i agree Maybe um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about when you um, when you first started uh, Lado a Lado or started to work this way um, with Faf Coffee. Um, um, I don't know. Was it about ten years ago? Did you say? Uh, no, uh, we began this this working um, five or six years ago, but. Um, Two years ago, we was uh, improved the process, improved the equipments, and uh, we was working about a small car and put the, the all the equipments and remove all the equipments. And uh, I think last year uh, we can um, <clears throat> we can leave this project uh, ready, ready for work. And this is the uh, first crop we really working about this project uh, with the good equipment and um, we have um, this time uh, more, we stay more efficient, 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 
Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, but uh, I had five years with testing, with testing this, this working because it's different um, than cupping coffees on the office. On the office, we have it all in your uh, place, all you clean, you have your water, you have your good energy. And but now we have the uh, solar panel, green, green energy. And uh, on the van, we have the um, pure water on the van. We have we have the, all the equipments and the best equipment uh, for uh, share this technology with this different way our farms. And how um, during this time, since you started um, working more intensely with the farmers, how um, has that impacted the way uh, the farmers do their work and how they can you can you tell us i know felipe you said you already said a little bit more about it mm -hmm. uh, in terms of um, the vegetation on the farm and and uh, hints about how you can change certain things but maybe you can talk a little bit more about how how the life and work process on the farm changes through the work that you do Oh, can continue, Philip? We lost your audio. Ah, yeah, your audio, uh, your sound is gone. <laughs> yeah, sounds gone. I may, yeah, it's okay. Uh, okay, so I continue. <laughs> um, so, uh, it's, it's clear for, for us when uh, this time I'm uh, drinking coffee from Teodoro, but this harvest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the new crop, uh, the same quality, the same balance, the same consistency. We begin uh, this. We begin working with Theodore when your harvest uh, begin this year, and we uh, stay together uh, week for week uh, and cupping together and <clears throat> improve the process. And this is the clear the 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 farm stay more professional. When you go to farms and work together, uh, 16, the next harvest the, the farms have uh, all in your place uh, for make the best crop. I don't know if it makes sense for you. Um, they, they implement the changes that you talk about right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, you, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah you're Back, right. Okay. I think it's also like a cultural thing where it's about discipline. Like, you know, when you have people coming over, you make sure that your home is nice and ready to receive people. And, and when the farmer brings the samples, um, they bring the samples already finished. We don't really see what was done behind the scenes. But when we go and visit the farm and um, uh, they, y you see that they quickly – they quickly clean things up. They quickly plant more flowers. They start to receive better. They, they paint the, the, the house a little bit better. They take care of the patio. So it's like, you know, when we taste, okay, this coffee is good. It, it could taste a little bit cleaner. And then you go and see the farm and you say, whoa, okay, you know, we could clean this up a little bit better. And then you suggest it and they do it because the next time we come, you know, it's almost like, uh, they, they've got, you know, we gave them some homework and we came back and we're going to come back and ask again. So, so you see this sort of change in everything in their lives. It's like when they become a specialty producer and, and you, they start to receive visits and they have their name on the package and stuff like that. There is this also element of responsibility that comes along with it and there's this change is this this pride in i produce this beautiful coffee and then there's a, like a lot more discipline involved so you know when you go to wineries and you go to, to breweries people are cleaning all the time and they're you know making it more hygienic and you go to farms and sometimes they're not the, the most you know sometimes they're not the most tidy places but then when you start having a specialty coffee farm um those little things they really change and those little things are the little extra things that make the coffee taste better so it, it does impact um not just their work with coffee but their actual lives and ways on the farm as well and yeah i i love the notion of of 
taking pride, you know, that, that it, it developed alongside uh, the copy quality. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, and and we joke, you know, because they they sometimes serve like a very dark coffee or with um with sugar and the worst coffee, and then we joke and we say, you, you try this this one this lot that you produce. This is what I want you to drink, and this is what I want you to serve. And then you know they 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 want to provide us with you know Coca Cola or something, you know, and it's like well because you know, that's a symbol of you know that the, that's you're well perceiving someone. And we said no, we we just want the juice, the fruit, whatever is here, you know, we don't need sugar, don't need the cakes, just, you know, the, 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 the cheese you make on the farm is better and stuff like that. And so it's, it's, it's slowly like a, even also like a cultural shift, right? Yeah. Uh, that happens. You've got a question that fits right into what we're talking about. Uh, Nick is asking how close is the link between improving quality and environmental impact of farming? Um, so I think that um, a high quality farm is generally working hand in hand with being a better managed uh, farm. And I think that there's a lot of ways to look at it. Um, you know, uh, uh, environmental sustainability uh, can be measured in a number of ways. Um, the first thing is the economical sustainability of the farmer um, and feeling like they're part of a supply chain, you know, that they can have some uh, control in their future. Um, and then I think that uh, we first start with the soil and the soil is about really building a living soil, living microbes, living uh, biomass, um, which is just going to be more balanced. And so we talk a lot about doing soil analysis and foliar analysis, you know, and, and we ask and they sometimes say, yeah, I do a soil analysis. And they say, when? Oh, three years ago, you know, and so a lot of times um, the farmers, if you're not, if your pH level is not corrected, it's not balanced, you can be basically throwing away 50, 60% of what you're, what you're, what you're putting into the soil. It's not, it's not absorbing. And so you're leaching away a lot of things that are not necessary. And if you create more biomass, um, you, the necessity of outside inputs is less and less. And then we slowly bring towards, okay, well, let's use cover crops and fixing nitrogen and let's use leguminous trees and let's try compost. And so a farm like Teodoro is 100% organic. He's not certified organic um, yet. He wants to, but the, uh, still hasn't invested in the cost and the bureaucracy behind that, but is already Uh, soil and already management is 100% organic. Um, that is uh, not necessarily the end goal for all our farmers because that is quite uh, a big jump. But um, when you start to add trees that we convince them will be better to windbreak, to protect the plants, for the shade, for the soil, you're ultimately adding sustainability, right? You're adding biodiversity, you're adding flowers for the bees, You're adding trees that will sec uh, sequester carbon. Um, you're, you're protecting. Uh, then we talk about protecting the water springs, how important that is. Uh, where farmers, coffee farmers are on tops of mountains, it's a lot of where the, 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 the fresh water springs start, you know? And so we're living in a world where most of our fresh water is being contaminated, um, you know, above ground and underground. Um, and if we can protect where it's starting, you know, and pass along. So we've installed a part of our side-by-side -side project. We've uh, reinvested in the communities. Uh, one of the things is we've done is sanitation filtration system. So after the water patio, after the depulper, the water patio and the house, there's a biodigester and uh, um, a filtration system that um, will deliver the, the water clean back into the stream downstream down the mountain so we've installed last year we installed 28 of those uh, 28 different wow. farms um, and so we've got um, several several projects um, you know the the I think just the social side of being together and being apart and talking and coming together is very important there's a social element to that as well so sustainability is is, is you know it's a, it's a big thing um, it, it can be you know I call it the soft side and the hard side. You have the, 
the, the, the imagery and the storytelling, and then you have the numbers, you know, what was done and stuff like that. So it's very, very um, hard. We teamed up with Inveritas. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, a group uh, worldwide that uh, verifies uh, farms. So we had 10 of our farms. So uh, Teodoro was one of those that was verified. Uh, so it's an out, outside, um, outside uh, thing that's neutral. They ask uh, hundreds of questions. They visit the farm and they give a score, a sustainability score for the farm um, based on uh, 30 criteria, 10 environmental, 10 uh, social and 10 economic. And so we have this image of how our farmers are doing um, and we can share, share with the roasters. So, um, so yeah, I think it, I think it goes hand in hand. It's not necessarily that all, all high or, but, um, just, just by being, uh, disciplined that tends to improve. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because, um, Theodoro have, uh, planted, uh, 300 new, uh, tree, native tree around your, um, farm and um, uh, maybe uh, Felipe tell more about your uh, last year uh, Teodoro making a uh, small project on the radio on the radio and um, uh, have the impact because having uh, 2,000 new trees because um, uh, Teodoro make a small small joke uh, maybe you tell more okay, about this yeah, so Teodoro had this brilliant idea of um, giving um, a prize to uh, someone, his neighbors who planted trees. He was trying to get his neighbors to plant trees because he's a kind of, um, diff he's, a, he's an outlier from, from the region. Um, so he's planting a lot of trees and stuff. And so he started giving a prize. He gave a bag of rice or a bag of honey uh, he makes honey, so he's back, he gets some honey and some stuff. And um, the local radio uh, called him on, and um, and they gave his idea, and they spread, and, and, and they also helped find people to give prizes. So uh, people from all over the municipality started calling in, and, um, and so Teodoro would give um, um, a, a baby, a sapling tree, and, mm -hmm. uh, and the radio helped collect prizes, and so... There were hundreds and hundreds of trees planted in people's yards and people's farms. And, and, and so they would post on Instagram and hashtag and, you know, la, la, la. So it became That's this cool. like uh, this uh, viral thing that he was uh, super proud to, to, to start and to bring more biodiversity. Oh, how cool. That's, that's such a cool story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's not even, that's not need, even yeah. like a, only a social media thing. Huh? It's a real life, real life hero who uh, is out there planting tr uh, trees. <laughs> I love yeah, it. <laughs> it's, it's the power of social media, you know, and as Hafa yeah. said, a lot of times the farmers are very isolated until Dotto is one that, uh, you know, we we when we first started working with him we met he's always an incredibly happy and and vibrant person but we felt he was um a little bit lonely and mm -hmm. and now he, through coffee he's like ever more a part of a community and uh oh. so it's it's there's definitely like a change in the um, in in the way that the farmers carry themselves as they as they become especially farmers. That's cool. That's really cool. It's really mm. cool to know. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I just to uh, get back and come full circle, essentially, I think um, what you just said, I mean, that goes far beyond just cupping coffees with farmers, right? I mean, you go in there and actually um, like do the agronomic consulting part of it all as well and and uh, give input and and bring actual palpable knowledge to the farm and to the farmers and how they can improve not only the cup quality but their entire biome on the farm essentially is that that's what i that's what i heard right now is is that a big part of your work as well then we we try. We have a, a agronomist project. Uh, we have um, 
a local agronomist that attends to the, um, the our farmers. We uh, are expanding the project. We we um, we try to bring funds and ask people to help as well. But basically, Faf Coffees will pay for half of the agronomist. The farmer has to pay for the other half. So not all the farmers are in the project, but we've seen um, massive improvements. Um, uh, and then we bring professional uh, technicals who, who help. And then our team um, is more specialized on post-harvest uh, and cupping. Um, and we do a lot of studies. So I'm on my farm. We have a lot of experiments we're running here, which we replicate and we do workshops. And we have um, a big study on varietals as well that we mm -hmm. replicate on, on other farms. So we have about seven varieties that we've developed on my farm that we, are, that we planted already in Theodoro's farm um, and test. So we have these model plots in, in each area we work in. These model farmers, uh, Clayton and Caparao, Teodoro and Spirit Santo, several farms that we uh, replicate these ideas before we spread them uh, widely so that we test them, make sure they work. Um, yeah. And um, before, we, before we necessarily tell people what to do, we want to make sure that we're very confident that that will happen or this will happen. And it's more of like helping them understand first their coffee and then helping guide them make their decisions to, oh, well, I want to, I want to produce more or I just want the coffee to be, taste more like this. And um, and we can give our opinion. That's super super interesting. Now I really want to come visit you <laughs> and see it all for myself. <laughs> yeah, um, please. I mean, yeah, as soon as the world uh, goes back to some version of normal, that's definitely on my list. <laughs> Um, I'm just conscious of the time. I love these chats and I could carry on forever. <laughs> you could probably tell. But um, there's one thing that I did want to uh, ask you about um, because especially um, with what's been in the media, in the coffee media anyways, over the last couple of months, um, the last two years must have been incredibly challenging for um, Brazilian coffee farmers because of COVID for one, because the, the pandemic just ravaged through your country, um, but then also because of severe weather. You had a drought, if I'm not mistaken, and then just a couple of uh, weeks ago or a month, uh, just about, um, you had a severe um, instance of frost as well, didn't you? Maybe you can um, tell us a little bit about that and then um, just to wrap things up, give a little bit of an outlook of how all of this will impact the next 12 to 18 months of Brazilian coffee and what some of the challenges are that you guys are facing. Um, so and, uh, I'll try to sum it up. It's a lot. Um, so we are experiencing a drought uh, for the past two years, a very severe drought, uh, especially in the, the west of the state of Minas and the state of Sao uh, so, Paulo. Espiritu Santo is, um, is, is uh, uniquely protected from the drought as it's very humid there. Um, and what happens is there's less, there's a water stress, the plants grow less, okay? Uh, and um, also when the flowering happened last year, uh, there was, a, there was a, a dry spell of 14 days that the plants, basically the flowers didn't turn into beans. So you had this beautiful flowering and then by December, we sort of quickly realized there's no beans on the tree. So the production, there was already whispers saying the production would be lower, about 20% in Brazil. And remember we were saying Brazil produces 45% of the coffee in the world. And so if you have 20% less, That's a lot. And then we had uh, the drought and the, the, the predictions um, and the, you know, of everything have been so volatile because one week COVID is, in, is improving, another week COVID is not. And then one week we have chance of war and then another week, whatever, something happens. So, so basically um, in the areas where it's dry, 
um, we, we, we also got hit with a, a series of three cold waves, cold fronts starting in July 1st, um, which started to affect really bad. And so uh, July 1st, July 20th, and July 29th. It was also the coldest year in the last 50 years uh, for our winter. Um, so basically, humidity in the soil uh, heats up a little bit during the day and keep, preserves a little bit of, of, of heat in, in the night. And um, when it's very, very dry, um, so you have these peaks of temperatures. And right around 6, 7, 8 in the morning is the coldest time of the day. And so uh, July 1st, July 20th, and July 29th, uh, temperatures hit below zero on several, several parts of Brazil. Um, and what that does is it, I got a lot of wind now, um, what that does is it, it freezes the tree, uh, and if it lasts for a long time, it can kill the leaves, uh, and they turn brown, and they look like they, 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 they were burnt. And then if it's very severe, so that would, that would decrease the production for the next year um, as the tree would grow less and produce less. If it's more severe, you have to prune the coffee or stump the coffee and basically cut it at the bottom. And so you lose two years of production. Um, so uh, we're, all, we're, we're, we're still in the drought. And once the rains start, we have an idea of what the production for next year should be. Um, the last time we had a, a serious uh, frost was in 1994. At that time, the produ producing countries, mainly Brazil and Colombia, they had a policy of stocking coffee. They would store coffee. They had 17 million bags of coffee in Brazil stored when that happened. Um, this year, we have zero bags stored. Brazil stopped doing that. Colombia stopped doing that. The only coffee in the world that's stored is in Europe and the US. And the US is very low. Europe has like 2 million bags in Switzerland and Germany. So that's what caused a gigantic, um, a big jump in the sea market, in the commodity markets. Um, and uh, over time, you know, we, we're, we're seeing a lot of stress in terms of lack of rain. And um, we're going to see as well, I just read a newspaper, rationing of irrigation. Um, so that probably the landscape will change where coffee is grown, where coffee can be grown, where it's grown over time. Um, so this will be more important to bring more sustainable uh, for, for farms, uh, ways of management if we are to secure more a balanced uh, production. Um, and um, in the short term, that will mean high prices uh, globally for coffee in the supermarket. Uh, for the next at least two years, two or three years, until Brazil is able to to recover um, production. Of course, if we have lockdowns and slowing down on the economy, is another other issues that we can't control. Um, for specialty, the, the the specialty people, I don't think it should matter. It should matter that much. I think that as a farmer, you know, the the people that are most affected are the people that are doing low-end specialty, you know what I mean? Um, saying that they're doing specialty, but paying low prices, um, trying, to, trying to tell the full story, but not necessarily a good value for the farmer. So if the commodity prices go up and it's more desirable for the farmer to sell to the local co-op than to sell to the roaster, then your business model maybe is not so sustainable because it's not if it's if if the farmer's not interested in selling to you then then you won't have the supply but for the people that are doing real specialty like you and like Joaquin and like these people um, that have a solid relationship uh, and so you'll have a, a constant flow and improvement of the coffee um, and I think that in fact the supermarket coffee becoming more expensive people will see a smaller jump between supermarket to people that are doing higher end coffee. So I think it's, well, we also have uh, a trucker strike in the country. We have COVID, which is raging, but now vaccines are ramping up quite a lot. Uh, we have elections next year in Brazil, which is going to be a disaster. I hope not. But, and then we have logistics, logistical issues right now in the world that are 
you probably see it in your supermarkets, everything, everywhere, every, anything that you need to order. Um, it, there's, a, there's a serious uh, increase in costs and logistics and time. So uh, it's interesting times we're living in for sure. But, you know, I think it's ever more important if there ever was a time to communicate to, the, to your consumers what's going on and why your business model is, is healthy and good, uh, good not for, just for the farmers, but also for, 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 for your consumers as well. This... Yeah, I, mean, I couldn't have put it in better words. <laughs> Thank you for, for summarizing it so brilliantly. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I think being part of the, the coffee world, um, it is quite disconcerting, the outlook um, over the next couple of years, but going forward as well, with climate change really, really changing the landscape of how, as you said, how coffee is grown, where it can be grown. That's definitely the fact in Brazil, but that affects most, most every coffee growing country on this planet. So yeah, it is definitely interesting times, also kind of scary times. But it's really good to know that guys like you are out there and are doing the work on the ground that will hopefully guarantee that um, we'll still be able to have beautiful coffees in the future. Might be less quantity than before. We might have to pay the actual realistic price for them, as we should anyways. But it's guys like you and the farmers you work with who, um, yeah, who put in put in the hard labor that will safeguard uh, coffee as a, as a plant, as a beverage, and as a way of life really going forward. So thank you so much for all that you do and uh, the amazing coffees that come out of your country. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very uh, much. For, for, again, uh, us. We wouldn't be any, anywhere without, without you guys roasting beautifully and and supporting us so thank you oh thank you yeah yeah i mean as you said it's side by side lado a lado lado a lado <laughs> with that big thanks for taking so much time today to talk to me i really really appreciate it and i know for a fact that a lot of uh, you guys out there really like these chats as well and are very interested in all of these topics and this was a big one this was a really really interesting conversation thank you so much I'll do and, uh, yeah i hug you for you Pardon? Theodoro send a hug. A hug? Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> That's right back to him. Abrazo. How do you say that? Yeah, abrazo, yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I hope I'll be able to come visit you soon. Please. Anytime. <laughs> thank you, guys. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.